Hey everyone, welcome back. So I have got my coffee ready and today we're going to be uh, looking at some MCMC experiments. So we have done a lot of um, theoretical videos on sampling. We've looked at accept reject sampling. We've looked at uh, the general idea of MCMC and some specific algorithms like Metropolis Hastings. And the natural question is which one should I use? What are the pros and cons? And sure, we talked about the pros and cons at a high level in those videos, but I wanted to actually go through a coding example with everybody and show you what can happen with these various methods uh, based on various choices you make, for example, for candidate distributions. So let's just get right into it here. Um, so we have a target distribution. So I'm just going to structure this as kind of going through the code, explaining key moments in the code. Um, and a lot of the code is commented so that when I publish this notebook, you'll be able to see that as well. So here's our target distribution P of X. So this orange line down here is P of X. Now, as in all the situations with accept, reject, and MCMC, we are operating under this assumption that we don't know the target distribution entirely. We only know the numerator of the target distribution, which here is F of X, which is this blue curve. So the first observation you wanna make sure you understand is that F of X and P of X are proportional to each other. You can think of that as I take P of X and I just stretch it up and that's how I get F of X but I don't know the stretch factor. And the only reason I was able to get the stretch factor here is using a very, very powerful technique called asking Wolfram alpha. And so I was able to get the normalization constant by plugging in this disgusting string of integrals that took me a while. But outside of that, it's not easy to get. So we have f of x, we don't have p of x, but our goal is to sample from p of x. How are we going to do it? And more specifically, our goal is going to be getting the expected value of a random sample from P of X. So that is, if I take many, many random samples from P of X and I take their expected value, I want the answer I get to be close to the true expected value from this distribution. And that true answer is 0.27. So we see this distribution looks kind of normal, looks kind of symmetric, but it's not exactly normal, it's not exactly symmetric. And the answer is 0.27 as the expected value of a random draw from P of X. And that I, again, got using the really complex method called asking Wolfram Alpha. So that's the answer. Now, let's try three different cases, three different methods that we can use to sample from P of X and see the merits of each one. So the first thing to note going in is that they're all going to work eventually. If you take a big enough sample size, they're all going to converge to the true answer. But we're going to look at what efficiency concerns you might have and other concerns you might have using one method versus the other. So the first one to keep things simple, we'll be using accept reject, sometimes called rejection sampling, with a normal 0, 3 candidate. This is not a theory video, but just in a nutshell, how this works is that it keeps proposing us samples from this normal 0, 3 distribution, and we accept or reject them based on some probability. And so that is exactly what's going on here, but the first thing we need to do is design this candidate distribution g of x such that after we scale that up by some big enough constant m, it always lies above f of x. So this is something we learned in the accept reject video, which will be linked below. So we see that using m equals 1 with this normal 0, 3 distribution uh, isn't going to cut it. So this is, in other words, just saying using the distribution itself, scaling it by a factor of 1. We want this orange line, which is mg of x, to be always above f of x. And clearly that's not the case here. What if we use m equals 10? Uh, it's better, but still it needs to be even bigger than that. Using m equals 1,000 seems like overkill. It seems like this orange line is clearly above the blue line, which is way down here. But even then, it's not sufficient, because if we go down here and I limit the y-axis to very small values, we see that for certain values of the x variable, the orange line is still below the blue line. And the reason is that this normal 0, 3, its tails have just shrunk so fast that it's going to have to get multiplied by an obscenely large number in order to be always above the blue line. And so we'll stop at 1,000 here because it should be OK. It's not going to give us exact results, but it's going to be OK for now. And now this chunk here you're looking at is the actual meat of the accept reject algorithm. So I've commented here, pretty simple to write, really. Um, you just say, I want to do a million rounds. So again, I want to emphasize this is not the number of samples we're going to get in the end. This is just the number of candidates that we're going to sample from g of x. And the number of samples we get depends on whether we accept or reject each candidate. So for a million rounds, we are going to grab a candidate from the normal 0, 3 distribution. We are going to compute the probability of acceptance, which is here, straight from the theory video. And if our random variable we get from uh, NumPy is less than the probability of accept, then we go ahead and just add this to our 
growing list of samples, okay? So at the end, we had a million different trials where we could have accepted the sample. How many of them did we actually accept the sample in this case? 6,748. That is not a lot, my friends. So the efficiency, efficiency calculated as the percentage of samples we accept is 0.7%. Let that sink in for a second. That's less than 1%. So we're saying that we had a million possibilities to accept a sample in less than 1% of them did we actually accept the sample. And the reason for this is just because of how big M is. Remember in our um, accept reject video, we said that the bigger M gets, the less likely you are to accept a sample. And so the less efficient your sampling method is. And since our M was a thousand, it's barely ever gonna be the case that we accept a sample. So that leads to a really bad efficiency. And let's see how well we did on the actual question at hand, which is getting the expected value of this distribution. So the empirical expected value, meaning the average of all samples that we accept, the average of all these 6,700 samples is 0.32. And the true expected value we saw in the beginning was 0.27. So not great, close, sort of close, maybe good enough for some applications, but it's pretty far off if you ask me. And so this is the histogram of all the samples we got. It's pretty jagged in my opinion. And the orange curve is P of X. So we see that it does generally follow the shape of the distribution, but there's a lot of error as well. Let's try to do a little bit better. So before we move on to MCMC, let's stay in the world of accept reject, but let's just change up the candidate distribution. Because the crux of the issue, we said, was the fact that M had to be scaled up so much. But let's step back even further. Why did M have to be scaled up that much? And the reason is that the candidate distribution, let me scroll up here, was centered at zero but our true distribution is clearly centered at something higher than zero. If they are more centered at the same place, then I wouldn't have to scale up the candidate so much for it to generally be above f of x. If they are centered at different places, then I'm going to have to scale up the candidate by a lot because I need even its tails to be above all of the f of x distribution. So let's pick something that's centered at one and hope for better outcomes. So we're going to be using a normal one for candidate. So I've changed the mean of the normal distribution to one, so it's centered closer to the center of our target. And I've also increased the standard deviation, so it has fatter tails. And now let's do the same experiment. If I use m equals one, clearly that's not gonna cut it. m equals 75, I just jumped there. Um, it looks like it's always above f of x. Let's zoom in a little bit. We see that uh, for a zoomed in version of the density, the y-axis, there's still cases where uh, mg of x is below f of x, but again, for the same reasons as above, we're gonna live with it for now. But the key observation here is that we only needed m equals 75 to achieve the same outcome using this better target, or using this better candidate distribution, versus before, using that terrible candidate distribution, we had to use m equals close to 1,000 to achieve the same picture. So that's the big difference here. And now I run the same code, this code is the exact same, and we see the number of samples we collect now is 90,000. And so the efficiency is 9%. Still not high by like objective standards, but if you're comparing less than 1% efficiency to around 9% efficiency, that is a really good improvement. That means that on average, we are going to accept nine times, more than nine times as many samples as we did before, which is good. And let's do the same analysis. We see that it's just as far off, um, probably because of this issue with the tails being mismatched, but the key is that we were able to get the same level of accuracy in estimating our true expected value, and we were able to get a lot more samples, have a lot more efficient technique. And now before moving on to our last case, where we talk about MCMC, let's take a look at the correlation diagram. In the correlation diagram, so the picture you're looking at here, the x-axis is the previous sample, and the y-axis is the current sample. So we keep uh, accepting or rejecting draws from g of x, and if we accept them, we add them to our list. So this is just saying, is the last sample we got correlated to the next sample we got? And the answer is no. We see the correlation is 0 0.01. So there is no correlation using accept reject between subsequent samples. They're all independent of each other. That's gonna be important, keep that in mind, because that's not gonna be true for MCMC. Speaking of MCMC, let's use our good friend, the Metropolis algorithm for case three. And our candidate distribution will be a normal distribution centered at the last sample, x underscore previous, and with standard deviation four. And let me walk through the code with you. 
So we start at some place. I'm just going to arbitrarily start with a sample of 1. That'll be our x0. And the number we've accepted is 0 so far. And again, n is a million. So we're going to walk through all million trials. And then we're going to sample a candidate. This should say normal here. We're going to sample a candidate from the normal distribution centered at the previous sample and with standard deviation 4. And then just like with accept or reject, we're going to calculate our own probability of uh, accepting this sample, and that's going to be minimum of 1, and the ratio of the function values of the current candidate to the last sample. So this is coming straight from the theory of MCMC, or more accurately, Metropolis algorithm that we saw in that video, also linked below. And if our np.random.random is less than the probability, then we go ahead and accept this sample. So this candidate gets accepted as our next sample. Otherwise, we just carry the last sample forward. And so we also need a burn in because we know with MCMC methods, eventually our Markov chain will start sampling from the target distribution, but for the first many samples, it won't. So the burn in is typically something like 1,000 or 10,000 or something. So we'll just use 1,000. And so retained samples is all of the samples we got starting at sample 1,000 going on to sample 1 million. The first thing to note, even before we look at any of the accuracy measures, is that using Metropolis, in this case, we were able to get 999,000 samples out of the million trials that we did, which is an efficiency of 99.9%, .9%, clearly better than the 9% that we got with the best version of accept reject, clearly better than the 0.07% we got with the first version of accept reject. So, this has the potential to give us a lot of good samples and not throw away a lot of data. And also another um, auxiliary measure we can compute is the fraction of samples that were accepted because if you remember in our Metropolis algorithm there was a step here that said either you accept the current candidate or you don't accept it and just carry over the last candidate forward. And so we get about 50% either way. So 50% of the time we accept the current candidate and 50% of the time we uh, roll over the last sample forward and um, there's no hard and fast rule about what that number should be but empirically or if you look at some studies people try to aim for around 30 to 50 percent using the normal distribution here so good shape and the last question we have to answer here is does this actually do the job does it actually get close to the true expected value and if we draw that again we see it gets a lot closer to the true expected value so the true expected value is 0.27 using the metropolis algorithm with this normal candidate, we were able to get 0.28, clearly better than the 0.32 we were getting with accept reject. And finally, let's look at the correlation because we want to see all sides of the picture. If I uh, draw the previous sample versus the current sample for this metropolis algorithm, clearly they're correlated. There is a 0.81 correlation, you can see it visually, so that is one of the drawbacks of metropolis. Even though it does give us a lot of samples, even though it does get us closer to the uh, true answer of the expected value, one drawback is that we have to accept that the samples are correlated with each other. So um, that's it. That was just kind of a sampling roundup, going through a different sampling techniques, how you would code them, comparing them, highlighting the importance of your candidate distribution that can make a big deal in your efficiency. Um, yeah, so if you, if you learn something, please subscribe, and uh, I'll see you next time.